Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. Asian markets begin the new trading week on a mixed note. The currency market, In the currency market, the dollar continued to surge while the pound retreated. The Indian economy clocked 8% growth for the first time in two years, growing 8.2% in the June quarter. Growth was spurred by consumer demand. The Supreme Court, in an interim order, has banned all construction activity in three states and a union territory. This after the states comply, uh, failed to comply, come up with a policy on solid waste management. It was a mixed August for auto companies with sales of two-wheelers remaining flat. Maruti Suzuki sales fell the most in two years. And the Indian contingent returns from the Asian Games with 69 medals, its biggest ever tally in the 18 editions held so far. Now, let's turn to the international markets and starting with the US markets first. The S&P 500 ended flat while the Dow edged down and the Nasdaq closed higher in light trading on Friday as Canada and the United States concluded trade talks without resolution ahead of the Labor Day weekend. Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg News has all the action of on Wall Street wrapped up for you in this report. Stocks finished relatively unchanged and mixed in Friday's Wall Street session. This after the major averages whipsawed between very small gains and losses. The Dow and the S&P 500 most of the day to the downside. The Nasdaq to the upside ever so slightly. But at the end of the day, trade talks between the U.S. and Canada stalled. They'll resume next week. And on this, we had that relatively flat finish. The Dow finished down about one-tenth of one percent. The S&P 500 was up fractionally. And the tech-heavy Nasdaq up almost three-tenths of one percent. Now, relative to sector composition, at the end of the day, it turned a little more bullish for the S&P 500. Six of its 11 sectors finished higher, including consumer discretionary and technology. Some consumer discretionary winners included Lululemon, up 13 percent, putting it at an all-time high in a blowout quarter, while Ulta Beauty, those shares up nearly 7 percent. They actually missed estimates, but they did sign an exclusive deal with Kylie Jenner, her cosmetic company. Investors and analysts very positive on that prospect. Relative to tech winners, we had the likes of Apple, those shares hitting a new all-time high. AMD and NVIDIA also strong in the day, as were the shares of Cisco Systems. To the downside, though, some of the uh, other internet-related companies, including Alphabet, Facebook, and Twitter, those shares fell on fears of the possibility of targeted big tech uh, regulation as Twitter uh, CEO Jack Dorsey and a Facebook executive will be testifying between before Congress next week. But the stock gains on uh, stock moves on Friday session might have been relatively small, but in the month of August, pretty big, big gains for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the Nasdaq up for a second month in a row. The Nasdaq up on the month of August 5.7 percent, its best August, going all the way back to 2000 bit risk on there. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, so that's how the U.S. markets ended on Friday. But the big talking point uh, entering this week is, in fact, the fact that President Donald Trump is ready to take the trade war with China to the next level. Bloomberg has reported that Trump has told aides that he wants to follow through on a threat to impose tariffs on another $200 billion worth of Chinese goods as a public comment period on the plan ends this Thursday. This would mean that more than half of all Chinese imports to the United States would be subject to tariffs. Stephen Engel of Bloomberg News reports. In two months time from now are the midterm elections, so you could likely to hear an amped up rhetoric coming from the White House as he wins political points in his mind for being tough on China. So this threat of another uh, you know, round of tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports plays to that narrative uh, among the hawks in the White House. If you, if you think that it's a battle of the two camps in the White House uh, between the likes of the USTRs, uh, Robert Lighthizer and uh, the trade advisor. Peter Navarro versus more moderates like Steve Mnuchin at the Treasury Department and also the economic advisor Larry Kudlow. It seems as though the Lighthizer Navarro team are kind of winning out on the narrative right now. So Trump is said to be readying, in announcing uh, an imposition of uh, more tariffs on some $200 billion once that consultation. 
It ends this Thursday, so that could be Friday morning Asia time. China has said or indicated it could respond uh, with duties of its own on some $60 billion worth of U.S. imports. Uh, but it's going to be a very pivotal week, obviously, uh, whether this amps up into uh, more of a trade war, uh, given the fact that there are no negotiations planned at all. All right, so that's the word coming in on the big talking point on global trade. That's between China and the U.S. Of course, uh, there are conversations, remember, that you heard uh, on uh, Canada and the U.S. that's uh, going on with regard to the NAFTA. So a lot of uh, deals that are being discussed on the global stage. But let's have a look at how the Asian markets are faring at the start of this week. In fact, the early rises, I'm talking about the Nikkei in uh, Japan and also the Kospi in South Korea. And in fact, the Australian benchmark had all started on a muted note. You have the Kospi, in fact, that has uh, lost more ground. Uh, and you have the Nikkei that's more or less trading where it was about half an hour ago. You also have the Chinese uh, benchmarks that have opened up and they've opened in the red with uh, cuts of about two tenths of a percent from what I can see. The Hang Seng in fact losing about six tenths of a percent in the first few minutes of trade. But you know with that let's uh, take a check on the Indian market at the start of the week uh, because as of now from what I can see uh, the SGX Nifty is indicating a different start for the Indian market. Let's go across to Agam Vakil, who's standing by uh, to tell you all about what to look for in trade today and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, so uh, the SGX Nifty, as of now, indicating a slightly positive uptick, uh, different from what the Asian markets are showcasing right now. Right. Uh, you know, Alex, as we have been talking about over the previous few days, we were expecting some more consolidation to come through, considering the, the levels at which the Nifty is currently trading at. But as you can see, the Nifty, uh, or rather the SGX Nifty, is at around uh, 11,750, and that's the mark around which a lot of technical analysts are expecting the Nifty to move within uh, and, you know, and around, or say about 100 point uh, plus and minus. That said, let's take a look at how we've seen the ADR span out over the uh, over the, the previous uh, well trading session and as you can see Dr. Reddy, Starter Motors, Infosys and Wipro all advancing in trade. Wipro of course has won a very large contract and we're likely to see positive uh, um, moves coming in in today's job trade. ICICI Bank remains unchanged and marginal moves for something like HDFC Bank and Vedanta. But that says let's take a look at how we saw our own market span out last Friday and as you can see there was a flattish day for the Nifty 50 mid cap and the small cap indices advancing and outperforming the, the broader markets. We had very little to speak for when it comes to the Nifty Banking Index and well, a little over a half a percent gains for the Nifty PSU Banking Index. But uh, when it comes to uh, some other well buzzing uh, well, in sectoral indices, we did have more strength in the Nifty Pharma Index and Nifty IT Index, of course, continues to climb on uh, well the strength that we've seen on TCS as well as Infosys. But um, well, Nifty Energy, of course, is the other one which has actually lost out in trade and we're down, that was down by around 1.2%. We should be watching out for uh, how we uh, how realty indices and perhaps the power indices will do in today's year of trade considering the construction ban that has come through. We are awaiting more clarity there. But of course, uh, on Friday, we saw very little activity when it comes to FIIs or DIIs. Well, less than 200 crores on a net basis for a buy and sell. But let's take a look at some other variables then and in terms of contribution, given the fact that the Nifty was absolutely flat, well, uh, you know, well, most of the losses were contributed by Reliance Industries, but it was very evenly split between something like an Infosys, l and and Tech Mahindra, along with HCL Technologies pushing the indices upwards. Well, in terms of the futures and options space, uh, again, uh, we're starting to see a little more accumulation. These are early days for the series, so we're not, we will most likely see a little more increase in open interest irrespective of whether or not the Nifty is going up or down. But uh, if, when it comes to the Nifty Banking Index, that is where we're starting to see a little bit of unwinding coming through. Uh, let's move on and talk about some other variables. And when it comes to your open interest distribution, as we saw in the previous series, we do have a lot of support over various levels starting from 11,400 to 
going about around 11,000, say, uh, 700 based on the open interest that we've seen in a lot of these puts. Of course, on the higher end, it is essentially 11,800, which will serve as a very critical resistance level. But uh, let's take a look at what's happened uh, on, on Friday when it comes to changes in OI. And considering it was the first day of the series, we, more li we, we saw a lot of writing coming through, 11,600 case in point and 11,800. But uh, the put call ratio, of course, uh, well, that's remains largely flattish considering we really didn't see too much change in the nifty and it's the same for the nifty banking index too let's talk about stocks then and that's where i want to draw your attention to mind tree which saw a lot of longs building up other than mind tree we also have focus on yes bank which saw a lot of weakness owing to us uh, uncertainty with respect to rana kapoor the ceo of the bank and of course other than that we also have something that page industries looking at a little bit of profit taking after hitting levels of 36,000 at one point time last week and uh, we are starting to see a little bit of profit taking coming through and KPRE Technologies of course is the other stock that we'll be watching out for towards fresh long. So uh, Alex, plenty of stocks out there to keep an eye on but when it comes to the benchmarks as I've suggested a lot of the analysts are of, of the opinion that we see a little more consolidation come through. Mm, in fact some of the indication was a positive today mm. might be on account of the macro data that we received uh, uh, on That's Friday right. also with yes. regard to the GDP growth. In fact let's talk about that. Thanks so much for that Agam. Uh, India's economy returned to 8% growth for the first time in two years, supported by a positive base effect. However, economic conditions have also steadily improved as the impact of demonetization and GST fade. Now, gross domestic product growth in the first quarter of FY19 was at 8.2% compared with 5.6% in the same quarter last year. In the fourth quarter of FY18, uh, GDP growth was at 7.7%. Now, in gross value-added terms, the economy grew at 8% compared to 5.6% last year. GVA growth, remember, has become a preferred measure of economic growth for most economists as it strips out the impact of indirect taxes and subsidies. Now, if you look at the internals, manufacturing grew at double digits in of the June quarter and construction made a strong recovery to grow at 8.7% which also augurs well for the job market. However, value addition in mining remained the same uh, at the same levels as uh, last year and on the other hand, agriculture grew at a robust 5.3%. Private consumption has picked up, implying a recovery in a consumer demand that drives the economy. A robust double-digit growth in investment demand indicated factories may be expanding their capacity to meet the additional demand. And meanwhile, government expenditure, a worrying sign there, which has been supporting growth, decelerated and uh, service growth slowed to 7.3% in the June quarter from 9.5% a year ago. Now, here's what economists had to say about the latest growth scorecard. We are happy that, uh, and, and, and this was expected uh, to a very large extent uh, because of the base effects of the previous quarter, the corresponding quarter of the last year. This, remember, this was the quarter just prior to the imposition of the GST. Oh. Uh, so there was a lot of inventory destocking uh, that had happened, and then this is what, uh, so uh, some part of this is due. But uh, after having said this, uh, beyond the, the base effect, I think there is also a significant bit uh, which is contributing to the current growth. Uh, so as, as you said, uh, a large part of this is coming from, from manufacturing, from industry in general, manufacturing in, in particular. Uh, and, and, and this was evident. I mean, you know, the numbers that we based on, the IIP numbers were strong, if you remember. And the initial numbers that we saw from the companies in the first quarter, uh, so those company results, I mean, the net sales, the profit margins, etc., which is an indicator of the value added that goes into the GDP. Uh, so even that showed a, a fairly strong growth. Certainly an upside surprise. We were uh, expecting growth to be closer to 7.5%. Uh, so uh, this is certainly come as an upside surprise to us. Part of what has grown faster than what we forecast is the sectors that did have a favorable base effect. So manufacturing where uh, we were uh, looking at a slightly different, uh, a slightly lower number based on what we thought in terms of uh, how many uh, industries actually had pricing power and uh, the ones that didn't uh, offset by the base effects related to GST etc. Uh, so that's one part of it. Uh, secondly, the agricultural number has come in a little bit higher than what we were expecting. And uh, the third upside really is coming in from the public administration, defense and uh, other services which is really uh, the balance of government spending in terms of the center and the states are uh, really getting reflected over there. 
so uh, i would say that these are the three major reasons one sectors that did have a favorable base effect growing faster than what we had forecast second agriculture and third uh, is really coming on the back of uh, government spending so while this number is certainly very positive and it's uh, very welcome i think uh, there are still some concerns that are lingering in terms of whether uh, this rate will sustain in the coming quarters or not all right now to talk about two markets that have seen considerable pressure in the recent past in fact we have saloni dhanuka who's joining us to talk about the rupee and the bond market saloni uh, apart from that of course there was moves in the currency market globally but uh, i'm guessing you want to start with the domestic currency Absolutely, Alex. So the rupee on Friday extended its downward movement and ended at a record closing low for the third straight session at 71 levels against the dollar. Remember, the home currency has depreciated over three and a half percent last month, thereby marking its biggest fall in nearly three years. Uh, well, rising crude oil prices, along with strong dollar demand uh, from importers, uh, along with a sharp sell-off that we have seen in Argentina and Turkey, has been weighing on the rupee of late. Well, speaking of the bond. Bond market sovereign bonds also saw their biggest fall in nearly four months, uh, largely weighed by currencies fall. The benchmark 10-year uh, bond yield ended at 7.95 percent. Uh, remember, the yields have risen almost 18 basis point in the last one month. Uh, well, on the global front. Uh, Dollar index gained for the fifth straight session, and it trades higher for uh, the and it trades higher, well above the 95 mark. Uh, well, speaking about euro and pound, both ended over half a percent lower versus the dollar on Friday. Now, on the global front, traders do believe that strong GDP growth uh, is negative for the bond markets as it increases odds of a policy rate hike by RBI. And lastly, if you see dollar rupee now, it is trading flat in the non-deliverable forward markets, which indicates a flat opening for Indian rupee in today's trade, Alex. All right, thanks so much for that, Saloni. Let's shift focus now and talk about commodities. Jayesh Kilani is joining in with all the updates uh, in in that market. Jayesh, what are you picking up with regard to the commodity space? Morning, Alex. Let me start off with oil prices, uh, which in fact uh, posted a monthly gain, uh, despite the fact that uh, the sanctions imposed on Iran uh, did ha in fact uh, stoke some uh, supply fears. Uh, now, despite of all of this, uh, crude uh, Brent Brent crude in fact posted its uh, largest monthly increase. Since the month of April, and all of this said and done, uh, Saudi Arabia also boosted its uh, supply in the month of August. So, you know, despite uh, some bit of negative coming out uh, for the oil markets, the price actually moved higher. Shifting focus to the base metal space, all of the base metals except for lead closed lower on the London Metal Exchange on Friday. Uh, copper posted its uh, longest monthly streak, uh, losing streak in fact uh, since May 2017. And also, that open interest for that metal is now, you know, close to the lowest level in about 19 months. Uh, on the other hand, we had the nickel, which uh, declined the most, about three and a half percent lower on Friday, and it was the third straight month of loss that we saw for uh, for that metal. Now, if you look at uh, aluminium. That in fact snapped its uh, two-month losing streak, and zinc posted its loss for the seventh consecutive month. So you know all is not well as far as the base metals are concerned. Uh, uh, the same case with uh, gold prices as well, which in fact uh, posted its uh, fifth straight uh, monthly drop on the back of rally in uh, the dollar index and equity markets as well. All right, thanks so much for that, uh, Jesh. Now, a high base uh, is finally catching up with at least some automakers. Sales in August for Maruti, in particular, saw a, a drop with sales falling marginally over the same period last year. Yash Upadhyay is here to take you through the numbers, most of which I think are in Yash. Uh, what is the picture looking like? So it's been a mixed month, uh, mi mixed bag when it comes to auto sales for the month of August. Uh, we start off with Maruti Suzuki, India's largest car maker, that reported a second consecutive month of degrowth in its volumes. This time, in fact, being the highest in the last two years, about three and a half percent drawdown, coming in at about 158,000 units, which is significantly lower than the Bloomberg Quint poll of 170,000 units, which the company attributes to the tragic floods in Kerala and heavy rains in other parts of the country. M&M Auto, on the other hand, came out with a good set of numbers. 14% growth in their volumes. Passenger vehicle sales were largely subdued, about a 2% growth there. But the commercial vehicle segment that is doing extremely well, a 25% growth there. So that's aiding M&M Auto. Ashok Leyland, another commercial vehicle player, reported a strong set of numbers: 17,400 units sold in the month of August, significantly higher than the Bloomberg Quint poll of 15,700 units. Both is key verticals, MHCV and LCV, are uh, doing extremely very well. In fact, the MHCV sales came in significantly higher uh, than the analyst expected. 
expectations. Escos, the tractor maker, reported a 5% growth in volumes. Tata Motors had another strong month, a 27% growth in volumes, only a tad bit lower than the Bloomberg Quint poll of 59,500 units. But both as key verticals, the, the, the domestic passenger vehicle business and the commercial vehicle business doing extremely very well for the company. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to the two-wheelers, not so inspiring story. So Hero Motor Corp, only about a 1% growth there on, on account of that high base and also the rains uh, in Kerala and other parts of the country impacting their volumes. And similar story when it comes to Aisha Motors as well. Only a 2% growth coming in at about 69,400 units, lower than the Bloomberg Quint poll of 75,000 units. So we could expect some weakness in Aisha Motors in today's day of trade. Uh, whereas TVS Motors reported a good set of numbers, an 8% growth coming in at about 340,000 units with its exports business and three-wheeler business, which posted a 56% growth, uh, doing very well for them. All right, thanks for that, uh, Yash. Now, what could hurt economic activity, auto sales, in fact, uh, the overall economy, much harder is an interim order passed by the Supreme Court, which has barred construction in three states and uh, a union territory till at least uh, October 9th. The Apex Court has cited the lack of a proper policy to deal with solid waste management in Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Uttarakhand and Chandigarh for passing such an order. Jesh Khilani is here to take you through all the ramifications of the order. Jesh, bad news for a number of sectors, I, I would think, uh, starting obviously with construction and uh, developers. That's right, Alex. Uh, in fact, uh, first let's have a look at uh, the states and the union territory that uh, you, you know we are working with, or the order that mentions. Uh, so we have Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Chandigarh, where uh, the Supreme Court has said that all construction activity be stopped with immediate effect. Uh, now the sole reason for this is that uh, the states have uh, uh, failed to you know uh, update uh, update the court as to their solid waste management policy. So on account of that, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, issued this order. Now. While the order is a little ambiguous, uh, there's a lot of clarity that uh, is needed from the order itself. Uh, one is whether if the order is uh, banning only new projects on all construction. So, you know, that's one question. Uh, the second question is uh, whether it uh, pertains only to real estate or to the entire infra uh, space on the whole. So, that will be the bigger impact that uh, we will see. Of course, uh, we spoke with a few industry personnel and, uh, you know, uh, Anuj Puri of uh, Anarok was one of them who said that um, uh, real estate, uh, if you talk about that sector, then the projects uh, that have, uh, you know, been behind schedule are worth nearly 4.64 lakh crores. So, you can, one can expect that uh, this will be further delayed now. Um, in fact, uh, what's the bigger impact is, uh, you know, the building material space, uh, they actually face uh, the immediate impact. So, some something like uh, cement players, uh, steel companies, style makers, uh, you know, companies that make pipes and the electrical equipment makers. Uh, these are some of the ancillary sectors that could be, you know, more impacted on an immediate level. Um, now, as a, as a remedy, what uh, the government could do or the Maharashtra government is, uh, you know, approach the Supreme Court to stay a ban on this particular order. However, as you mentioned, the next hearing is on 9th of October. So, we'll have to wait and watch how the entire market takes this. Uh, but on the face of it, clearly negative news. All right. Thanks so much for that, Jesh. Now, Google has reportedly bought MasterCard credit card data in the U.S. to help attract users' offline spending in stores. But the two firms did not make the deal public. The confidential nature of the deal has raised privacy issues. Here's more. Now, there's clearly lots to talk about over the course of the day. It's the start of the week, of course, and you'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. There are also several stories on the website that you can consider reading at the moment. But remember, that's www.bloombergquint.com. Here are just a couple. The country's gems and jewelry exports contracted by about 5% to $10.64 billion in April to July this financial year on account of a demand slowdown in major developed markets. And the Competition Commission of India has dismissed two complaints alleging abuse of dominance against realty major DLF with regard to conditions in the sale agreements of residential apartments in Gurgaon. 
All right. Now, this uh, recent uh, order, of course, uh, that Jayesh told you about with regard to construction activity in those states is going to have a bearing on several stocks, I would imagine. But what are the stocks broadly that you have to watch out for in trade today? Shraddha Babla is here to tell you about the stocks in news. Shraddha, I'm, I'm guessing you have quite the list today. Uh, yes, I do, since we've come from a long uh, weekend. Uh, not a long weekend, but a, a weekend. Uh, we have Wipro, which should remain in focus amongst the large caps. Alex, they've bagged a $1.5 billion uh, deal from Allied Solutions. It's a it's a contract which will uh, uh, be over a 10-year period, so it will add to about 2% uh, uh, to annual revenues incrementally. You also have uh, US FDA, which is uh, completed auditing Sun Pharma's Halol plant with no observations. That's what two people familiar with the matter have told Bloomberg Quint. The company, of course, uh, declined to comment to the queries, but that's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Watch out for Sun Pharma. Also, a couple of divestments and acquisitions that we saw over the weekend. You have LNT, which is uh, looking to sell 3.41% stake in LNT Infotech via an offer for sale, whose floor price has been fixed at 1,700 rupees per share. That's about a 5% discount to Friday's closing price, so that may weigh on the stock. You have Godrej Consumer, which via its subsidiary has divested its entire stake in the UK arm for 34. Uh, million uh, British pounds that's about um uh, that's the stock to watch. And also Graphite India, where the company's Netherlands subsidiary will acquire 46% stake in General Graphene Corporation for about $18.6 million. That's about 130 crores. So you might see some reaction there as well. Ramke Infra will sell 100% stake in NAM Expressway for 140 crores, along with all its liabilities. Uh, so the key here is that post this, uh, this uh, sale, uh, the company's consolidated debt will reduce by about 1,500 crores. LT Foods, the board has approved investment of 140 crores by India Agri Business Fund 2 in its wholly owned subsidiary Nature Bio Foods. So that's another one that I will definitely be watching out for. And finally, you have Moil, which has revised the price of different grades of manganese ore and other products with effect from 1st of September. The ferro grade prices have been increased by 5%. So again, that's uh, another stock to watch out for, Alex. All right, thanks so much for that, Shraddha. Clearly, lots of stocks that you have to watch out for in trade today. But uh, here's a special story. You've all by now heard about the multi crore rupee fraud that was allegedly perpetrated by Nirav Modi. But did you know that his company sent diamonds to each other using the FedEx delivery service? Here's how that scam worked, apparently. How does the value of a yellow orange cushion cut diamond fall six times and then rise back up all in a matter of weeks? It does when the diamond belongs to Nirav Modi. A three-carat gem was sold by Firestar Diamond to Fancy Creations Company for almost $1.1 million in August 2011. Two weeks later, it was shipped back to Firestar Diamond for $183,000. A week after that, the diamond was shipped again to Fancy Creations, this time for $1.16 million. And two weeks later, the same diamond, now with AJAF in New York, was sold to World Diamond Distribution for more than $1.2 million. It turns out that Firestar Diamond, Fancy Creations, AJAF and the World Diamond Distribution are all companies indirectly controlled by Modi. This as per a report filed in the US Bankruptcy Court. Round tripping or trading a good repeatedly among related parties was to make it look like there were distinct transactions. These in turn were useful in generating multiple shipping invoices. Invoices that resulted in India's largest bank fraud with Modi's firms getting short-term loans from Punjab National Bank worth 24,000 crore rupees through fake LOUs. One of them involved Modi using six dummy companies to divert $50 million that was eventually invested back into Firestar International as foreign direct investment, making Nirav Modi a foreign investor in his own company. And that's not all. In what could be the most bizarre twist in this case, the three US companies owned by Modi exported diamonds, some valued at $1.7 million, via FedEx. Even when FedEx does not insure any package over $150,000. Which begs the question, why did Modi and co. choose to send precious gems in courier packages instead of bonded couriers? Or did the packages contain real gems at all? Nirav Modi has denied all allegations. All right. Well, that's a decent start, wouldn't you say, to your Monday morning. Up next, of course, on Bloomberg Quint is all you need to know, so do stay tuned.